Hello everyone and welcome to my young and restless gossip channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Tucker discovered Ashley at his hotel room door. She stormed in and challenged him about what he had said downstairs about her fear of commitment and inability to be happy in a relationship. Tucker challenged her to prove him wrong. Ashley chastised him for fooling himself that she was the one with the problem, but Tucker insisted that she was rewriting history. She snapped that she understood precisely what he was attempting to accomplish. Tucker warned Ashley that she wouldn't be able to get him to lose his temper and turn over a table to validate her claim. She protested that she wasn't the one playing games. He reasoned that if it were a game, he'd have a good time, but he assured her that it wasn't. She accused him of gaslighting her, but he wondered what he had to gain. Ashley alleged that it was retaliation for her refusal to leave Jabot. Tucker responded that she had never met him before. Ashley described Tucker as selfish, arrogant, and narcissistic. Tucker calmly explained that he had never been motivated by a desire to harm anyone, particularly someone he loved. Ashley exclaimed that Tucker should be ashamed of himself for using the term love as if it meant nothing. She complained that he had used it to dominate her, but he retorted that she had demonstrated that she had nothing and required no one, even him. He vowed he would have done anything for her, and all he asked in return was love, respect, and dedication. Tucker went on to say that he had wanted to be Ashley's partner in everything, but she couldn't give that to somebody who didn't share her DNA. He proclaimed it game over for him and moved on. Tucker advised Ashley to give up her fascination with what had transpired in Paris, as the scene as she remembered it was unrecognizable to him. He suggested she get on her luxury jet, go to the bistro, and tell the waitstaff what had transpired that afternoon. Tucker anticipated her to be astonished by what they told her. Ashley walked out. Ashley recalled her experience with Tucker in Paris, where he had aggressively destroyed a glass, pushed over a chair, and yelled in her face to go to hell. Her thoughts drifted to Tucker's considerably more composed depiction of the same scene. She sat down and commanded, Get out of my mind. I know what I know. Tracy approached the room and realized something was amiss. She begged Ashley to tell her what was going on so that she could help. Ashley explained to Tracy how her recall of Tucker's strong rage differed greatly from his remember of them having a typical dispute that he had walked away from. Ashley complained that he continued telling her that she was misremembering and had the entire situation wrong. Tracy considered what Tucker may gain by convincing Ashley that she had warped reality. Tracy recognized that Tucker was not Prince Charming, but she had never imagined him as the type of man who would remove butterflies' wings. Ashley affirmed that he wasn't, and she'd never seen him be violent toward anyone. Ashley told Tracy to imagine she was writing a novel. Tracy saw her characters as a powerful executive and a shady Lothario, and she admitted that she usually let the characters speak to her. Ashley argued that making up things was not part of her personality. Tracy hissed that if Tucker was gaslighting Ashley, he'd regret it once Tracy finished with him. The sisters embraced. Tracy was concerned that Ashley was doubting her recall. Ashley explained that Tucker believed she was rewriting history to push him out of her life because she was terrified of commitment. Tracy claimed that every tale had three sides, which in this case were Tucker's, Ashley's, and the truth. Tracy wondered how they could come closer to the truth. Ashley cried, I know of a way. Claire awoke in the psychiatric facility to see Nikki standing next to her bed, and she questioned if it was a nightmare. Nikki reassured Claire that she was awake and shouldn't be terrified. Nikki mentioned that she wanted to see how Claire was doing. Can you help me? Why would you want to? An astonished Claire inquired. Claire remembered that Nikki had previously saved her life, but Nikki pointed out that Claire had also saved Nikki's. Claire accepted that Nikki had every reason to detest her. Nikki agreed that she had every reason to despise Claire, but she didn't. Claire groaned as Nikki pitted her, which was even worse. Nikki knew that Claire's upbringing had been vicious and relentless, and Claire had been unable to avoid being a product of it. Claire compared herself to a broken vase, with pieces that would never come back together properly. Nikki mentioned that they were all a little broken, but the question was whether Claire wanted to improve. 
Claire pondered if that was really possible given that she had been reared with lies. Nikki lectured them on how they were all stronger than they gave themselves credit for, and they only needed to be bold enough to dig down to discover it. Claire admitted that while she felt powerful and capable at times, it seemed futile at others. Nikki stated that no one could handle it alone, and she emphasized that Cole and Victoria wanted to be there for Claire. Claire believed she needed someone who knew the entire story and would tell her the truth. Am I inherently evil? Claire inquired. Nikki pledged not to condemn Claire, who had been born perfect and innocent until an evil force intervened. Nikki reminded Claire that they had saved each other's life and asked her to recount how she spent her days there. Claire stated that she was waking up on time for breakfast and that she had been sleeping well. She discussed her group therapy and craft classes, and she joyfully stated that her new privilege was going on walks to other floors with the orderlies to get exercise. Claire went on to say that she went to pediatrics, where the kids talked to each other and knew all of the nurses. Claire was astounded that the parents read stories and played cards when they came and that the mothers and fathers all smiled, despite their concerns. Nikki stated that it was something parents did to keep their children from being terrified. Claire sympathized with the children who were sick or damaged, but she admitted to being jealous at times since she knew what a family should be like. Claire admitted that she had wanted it for a long time, but hoping had not resulted in anything, so she had quit wishing. Claire wondered what Victoria was like when she was younger, and she bet Nikki had shielded her from things and people who would have injured her. Nikki recalled Victoria's affection for her horses, how she kept them under control while allowing them to feel free. Nikki added, Victoria was an avid reader, and Claire mentioned that Victoria had dropped off books for her. Nikki explained that her daughter enjoyed painting, visiting museums, and working in her art studio, but Victoria no longer had much time for art due to job and family responsibilities. Claire wanted someone to smile when they heard her name and be happy of what she'd accomplished, as Nikki was with Victoria. Nikki knew Claire was feeling quite alone, and Claire explained that she had thought Jordan was all she had. Claire imagined having a mother who loved her and living a life in which she wasn't obliged to perform, fake, or do what she was told without creating a fuss. Claire imagined things would have been very different if someone had seen her as a person rather than a weapon or a tool. Claire cried because she kept thinking it wasn't fair, but then she heard Jordan in her thoughts telling her life wasn't fair and questioning why Claire believed she was unique. But I was. I was special for a short time, wasn't I? Claire wailed, I was Victoria's baby. Nikki advised them that it would be lovely if they could go back in time and repair what they had done to others and others had done to them, but all they had was the present, and they needed to find a way to break free from the past. Claire wasn't sure she could, because Victoria noticed her deceased baby when she looked at Claire. Claire explained that when she looked at Nikki, she saw the horrific things Jordan had forced Claire to do. Claire inquired as to what Nikki saw when he glanced at her, but Nikki remained silent. Just like I thought, Claire exclaimed as she began to sob. Claire apologized, but Nikki realized that Claire needed to experience her emotions in order to go forward. Nikki liked Claire's ability to settle herself, which Claire assumed was a habit. Claire revealed that Jordan wasn't a big hugger, and her aunt's embraces were either overly tight because she was upset at Claire, or Jordan hugged her just to mumble something horrible into her ear. Claire stated that it had become typical for her to simply cope with it when she felt hurt or unhappy. Nikki insisted that it should not have been normal for any child, and that Claire's life was not intended to have been like this. Claire stated that she had learned this and that she should rest. Nikki left the room and hovered outside the door, deep in concentration. Later, alone in the park, Nikki took a flask from her purse.